The hot-tempered and cruel half-Fomorian, half-Tuadedanan king, Bres, or Bresh, has long been misunderstood. Indeed, his multidimensional nature and his special divine role within the overall theology has been repeatedly defamed by a shallow grasp of the material. The sun god is both cruel and life-giving, but he must be overcome for the sovereign soul to reach perfection. First, the sun god incarnation of the Mahabharata, Karna, is one of the two main warriors of the opposition against the Pandavas, the incarnations of the main gods of society. So if parallels from the Mahabharata hold with Irish mythology, as we have seen repeatedly to be the case, we should actually expect the sun god to be one of the primary opponents of the main gods. Another two cases of this feature of archaic Indo-European theology are the handsome archer Paris from the Iliad and the hunter Granu the Radiant of Welsh mythology, both of whom are forms of the same deity as Bres, the handsome former ally, often an archer, who becomes one of the chief antagonists, the sun being that which must be overcome by the divine sovereign in order to achieve true victory and immortality. Once we understand that Nuada is Varuna and Lu is Mitra, we can see that their reigns as kings of the Tuadidanam should fall during the first and last halves of the yearly cycle, respectively, with the Mitraic god generally having his festival in autumn, as Dumasil explains, and with Lu indeed having his festival, Lunasa, at the point which marks the beginning of autumn. Thus, if Nuada's reign is during the beginning half of the yearly cycle, and Lu's is connected with autumn, then Bress, who rules between them, must rule during the heat of the summer specifically. This middle point of the cycle is analogous to both the peak of summer and the noon of the day when the sun is highest in the sky. Bress begins as an ally of the main gods, and then his rule becomes cruel and inhospitable, mirroring the progress of the sun from gentle sunrise to harsh midday or midsummer sun. It is telling that under Bress's rule, the other gods are forced to labor. When Bress is satirized by the poet Kerpra at the height of his reign, it is said that naught but decay was on him from that hour. This again can be read as describing the decline of the sun's power as it falls from its peak in the sky, or from its maximum during the middle of summer. Lastly, I'm going to read the conception narratives of both Bress and Karna, the incarnation of Surya in the Mahabharata, to illustrate just how incredibly close they have remained after so many millennia of divergence. First is the conception of the Indian hero Karna, found in the Srimad Devi Bhagavatam, Book 2, Chapter 6. Note that Karna's mother Kunti's original name, Pritha, is the feminine form of Pritha, flat, closely related to Prithvi, which is the name of the archaic Mother Earth goddess suggesting that Kunti may originally have been an earth goddess incarnation, as the mother of Bress also is the earth goddess. Here is the text of the first tale. The sun, Surya, then assuming an excellent human form, came down from the heavens and appeared before Kunti in the same room. Seeing the Deva sun, Kunti became greatly surprised and began to shudder and instantly became endowed with the inherent natural quality of passion, i.e. had menstruation. The beautiful-eyed Kunti, with folded palm, spoke to Surya Deva, the sun god, standing before. I am highly pleased today seeing thy form. Now go back to thy sphere. Surya Deva said, O oh Kunti, what for you called me, by virtue of the mantra, calling me, why do you not worship me, standing before you? O oh, beautiful blue one, seeing you I have become passionate, so come to me. By means of the mantra, you have made me your subservient, so take me for intercourse. Hearing this, Kunti said, O oh, witness of all, O oh, knower of Dharma, you know that I am a virgin girl. O oh, Suvrata, I bow down to you. I am a family daughter, so do not speak ill to me. Surya then said, If I go away in vain, I will be an object of great shame and, no doubt, will be laughed amongst the gods. So, O Kunti, if you do not satisfy me, I will immediately curse you and the Brahmin who has given you this mantra. O beautiful one, if you satisfy me, your virginity will remain. 
nobody will come to know, and there will be born a son to you exactly like me. Thus saying, Surya Deva enjoyed the bashful Kunti, with her mind attracted towards him. He granted her the desired boons and went away. The beautiful Kunti became pregnant and began to remain in a house under great secrecy. Only the dear nurse knew that her mother or any other person was quite unaware of the fact. In time, a very beautiful son like the second son, S-U-N, and Kartikeya, decked with a lovely kabacha coat of mail and two earrings, was born there. The following is the conception of the Irish god Bress, found in the Kah Moitura. Eriu is the embodiment of the land of Ireland, as her name tells us. The deeper etymology of the name appears to be abundant, a description of the fundamental quality of the fertile and sustenance-giving earth, and she apparently is the mother earth of Irish myth. Here is the text. Now the conception of Bress came about in this way. One day, one of their women, Eriu, the daughter of Delbaith, was looking at the sea and the land from the house of Maith Skaney, and she saw the sea as perfectly calm as if it were a level board. After that, while she was there, she saw something. A vessel of silver appeared to her on the sea. Its size appeared great to her, but its shape did not appear clearly to her, and the current of the sea carried it to the land. Then she saw that it was a man of fairest appearance. He had golden yellow hair down to his shoulders, and a cloak with bands of gold thread around it. His shirt had embroidery of gold thread. On his breast was a brooch of gold, with the luster of a precious stone in it. Two shining silver spears, and in them two smooth riveted shafts of bronze. Five circlets of gold around his neck. A gold hilted sword with inlayings of silver, and studs of gold. The man said to her, Shall I have an hour of love-making with you? I certainly have not made a tryst with you, she said. Come without the trysting, said he. Then they stretched themselves out together. The woman wept when the man got up again. Why are you crying, he asked. I have two things that I should lament, said the woman, separating from you however we have met. The young men of the Tuadedanen have been entreating me in vain, and you possess me as you do. Your anxiety about those two things will be removed, he said. He drew his gold ring from his middle finger and put it into her hand, and told her that she should not part with it, either by sale or by gift, except to someone whose finger it would fit. Another matter troubles me, said the woman, that I do not know who has come to me. You will not remain ignorant of that, he said. Elaha Mac Delbaith, king of the Fomoire, has come to you. You will bear a son as a result of our meeting, and let no name be given to him but Yohu Bress, that is, Yohu the Beautiful. Because every beautiful thing that is seen in Ireland, both plain and fortress, ale and candle, woman and man and horse, will be judged in relation to that boy, so that people will then say of it, it is a breast. Then the man went back again, and the woman returned to her home, and the famous conception was given to her. Then she gave birth to the boy, and the name Yohu Bress was given to him as Elaha had said. A week after the woman's lying in was completed, the boy had two weeks' growth, and he maintained that increase for seven years, until he had reached the growth of fourteen years. Later in the same text, when Bress has grown, Then he went to his mother and asked her where his family was. I am certain about that, she said, and went on to the hill from which she had seen the silver vessel in the sea. She then went on to the shore. His mother gave him the ring, which had been left with her, and he put it around his middle finger, and it fitted him. She had not given it up for anyone, either by sale or gift, until that day there was none of them whom it would fit. If it is not patently obvious to the listener just how similar these two passages are, we will enumerate the ways in which they match each other almost line for line, though the order of the events is in a couple places switched, and the Irish passage consistently uses oblique allusions where the Indian passage states what it means directly. 1. The sun god appears suddenly to the woman in her room. In the Indian case, this is explicitly stated. In the Irish case, the fact that this is the sun god is only alluded to by the description of his gold circlets, clothes, hair, and jewelry. Despite this elusiveness, Elaha's identity as a sun god has long been guessed, 
as the scholar T.F. O'Reilly did in 1946 in On the Origin of the Names Erain and Eriu in Eriu, volume 14, page 26. And it cannot be said to be hidden. The correspondence to the Indian myth merely confirms what has long been the leading thought regarding Elaha. 2. The woman is possibly an earth goddess. As aforementioned, Kunti's original name, Pritha, is the feminine form of Pritha, closely related to Prithvi, goddess of earth. Eriu, as indicated by her name, is the embodiment of the land of Ireland, which then stands in for Mother Earth. 3. The woman is a virgin. This is stated outright in the Indian case. In the Irish passage, Eriu comments that the young men of the Tua de Danan have been entreating me in vain, implying that she had been a virgin as well. 4. She denies him with her first words. The first thing Kunti says is, I am highly pleased today seeing thy form. Now go back to thy sphere. The first thing Eriu says is, I certainly have not made a tryst with you. 5. He is pushy and asks specifically for intercourse or copulation. Due to how often sexual illusions become softened or covered up, especially in Indian mythology, it cannot be overemphasized how significant it is that both accounts use equivalent unadorned terms for the sexual act at this very point. Surya says, You have made me your subservient, so take me for intercourse. In Elizabeth Gray's translation of the Kahmutura, Elaha says, Shall I have an hour of lovemaking with you? However, this translation and others have euphemized the original language here, which has generally been seen as too brash in its phrasing, in which a word more accurately translated as copulation is used at this point, just as the word for intercourse is used in the Indian case. Morgan Daimler, in a literalist translation, translates it as, Shall I have an hour of copulation with you? Thus, the similarities of the two texts occur right down to the use of approximately the same explicit terminology at a key moment. 6. They lie together. 7. The woman expresses anxiety over losing her virginity. Just before they lie together, Kunti says, O witness of all, O knower of Dharma, you know that I am a virgin girl. O Suvrata, I bow down to you. I am a family daughter, so do not speak ill to me. Just after they lie together, Eriu says that one of the things she laments is that the young men of the Tuade Danan have been entreating me in vain, and you possess me as you do. That is, she is anxious about having given up her virginity. 8. He removes her anxiety about this. Surya says, If you satisfy me, your virginity will remain. Elaha says, Your anxiety about those two things will be removed, and gives her a gold ring. Because there is no clear indication of how the gift of the ring will alleviate her anxiety over her lost virginity, the possibility must be considered that Elaha may also restore Eriu's virginity along with this gift, and that this fact is again only being obliquely alluded to, as other details have been in the Irish case. However, it must be said that the restoring of virginity seems like a trope more common in Indian myth than in Irish. Yet, due to all of the other alignment between these parallel passages, we must attempt to imagine that these details regarding the alleviation of the virginity anxiety may have in some way had a unified meaning in some kind of a shared origin. 9. The father foretells that a son will be born. A son is born who is exactly like his father. This is stated explicitly in the Indian case. There will be born a son to you exactly like me. The Irish case similarly has, You will bear a son as a result of our meeting. However, in the Irish case, the fact that the son is just like his father is again only alluded to, but it is not exactly hidden either. The ring that Elaha gives to Eriu, he takes off of his own finger. He then tells Eriu to give this ring only to the man whom it will fit. The only man whom the ring fits ends up being Elaha's own son, Bress, and it would fit no other. With the context of the Indian version, it becomes clear that this is an illustration, as opposed to an outright statement, of the same fact that we find in the Indian case, that the son is identical to the father. 
The father's ring fits only his son, because his son is just like his father. Their fingers, as every other part, are perfect doubles. Their fingers are being used as synecdoches in this way, one part standing in for the whole. The full meaning of this Irish passage can indeed only be grasped by its comparison with the Indian case. It is not telling us that Bress had only a family resemblance to his father. It is telling us that Bress is his father's double. And as his father, Elaha, is the golden-haired god, wearing the golden circlets and clothing, a blatant solar figure, so Bress is also the sun god, born again from his sun god father. 10. The sun is specifically said to be very beautiful upon his birth. In time, a very beautiful sun is born, says the Indian text. So beautiful is Bress, said to be upon his birth, that he is named Yohu Bress, that is, Yohu the Beautiful. Because every beautiful thing that is seen in Ireland will be judged in relation to that boy, so that people will then say of it, it is a Bress. 11. A type of ring jewelry is given by the father to the son, which marks him as son and double of the sun god. Surya's son, Karna, is born wearing earrings that make his face shine, along with a breastplate. It is implied that these come from his sun god parentage, inborn gifts from his father that manifest his solar quality and show him as the son of the sun. Elaha gives Eriu the ring upon Bress's conception that Eriu later gives to Bress, which itself is a symbol of Bress's identity with his father, the sun. Thus, although Bress receives the ring later, while Karna has the earrings at birth, they carry the same meaning and provenance. And incidentally, the golden ring of Bress is also a symbol of the sun itself as a golden circle. 12. The father leaves the mother abruptly, immediately after the conception, and the son does not know his true father until an event connected to the Great War. Karna does not find out his true parentage until well into the Kurukshetra War, while Bress finds out who his father is after the first battle of Moitura, and right before he sparks the second battle of Moitura, thus midway through the double war of the Irish myth. 13. From one of the two of this parent couple springs many of the other main gods or god incarnations. That is, this is an important divine ancestor pairing. 14. While Karna is explicitly a manifestation of the sun deity, Bress is called Horseman, a not uncommon title for various chiefs, but also fitting for a solar figure, the horse being a common solar symbol. He also is said to grow from birth at twice the normal rate, another solar trope possibly mirroring the sun rising rapidly in the morning sky. At this point, it should be more than evident that these two passages are from the same original myth, connected in both cases to a pair of father and son sun gods. The fact that Bress and Elaha are both sun gods, rather than merely one or the other being such, is extremely surprising and likely never could have been predicted or perhaps even believed without comparative analysis making the conclusion undeniable. One thing to note is that the sun god fathered by his own self from the previous cycle is a well-established feature of Egyptian mythology. As such, it is likely that we should consider this Indo-European myth along the same lines. Elaha and Bress are the same divinity at core. One is merely the sun from the day or the year before. Perhaps the rebirth of the sun from Mother Earth was even ritually connected to the time around or following the winter solstice, when the sun of the new year rises from darkness. The uncanny closeness of these two passages, separated by nearly four millennia, considering when these branches split, and then when each passage was committed to writing, and yet more similar to each other than some myth variants of a single tale within a single tradition or, represents a shining pearl in the comparative mythology treasure trove, and gives to us the gift of a confident identification of the father and son Irish sun gods. The fact that these passages can have been preserved so closely for so long is a minor miracle, and should inspire any reader with a new respect for the conservative quality of the Irish and Indian traditions in general, and the quality of the Kah Muitura in particular. This comparison also confirms much of what we have implied about the Fomorians. They are not to be seen as pure evil beings. They include the sun gods, 
and could include other sometimes benevolent, if potentially asocial and antagonistic, divinities as well, if we could successfully excavate them and see them for who they are. A few descriptions of Bress in the Dinchenahas serve to illustrate that the wider tradition regarding Bress's character was much more positive than the narrow depiction of his actions in the Great War would cause us to think. In these descriptions, Bress is called kindly friend, noble and fortunate, ornament of the host, with a visage never woeful, flower of the two a day, hot of valor, and spear attended king. It does not take much cleverness to see how these epithets reflect the particular qualities of the sun god that we have claimed him to be. My book, Taliesin's Map, The Comparative Guide to Celtic Mythology, is available from Amazon. Link in the description. <laughs>